I own a 700 horsepower BMW 335i, and for the most part, I daily drive it. A popular question many ask me is, Christian, can you really daily drive it? How's the ride comfort, fuel economy, and reliability? Does it make sense, or should you have an alternative car to drive more often? My goal in this video is to go over my experience with my specific build, and it should help you better understand if this car is daily drivable for your needs. So I went ahead and put the E90 in the lift so I can better show you guys all the upgrades. The truth is that, you know, when you're producing 700 horsepower to the wheel, you want to make sure that you upgrade certain things so you get less flex, less slop. You want proper power delivery to the rear wheels. Start with the front of the car and then we'll make our way to the back. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. Looks like I might have killed something. Starting with the transmission, this was one of the very first things that I upgraded. Well, not the transmission itself, but the clutch before I went single turbo. Upgraded to a DKM twin disc clutch that can hold the 650 torque that I'm making. So that was very, very important. One major drawback we have to talk about when we're talking about the clutch, the twin disc clutch. Even though it holds all the power and it's great and it should be super reliable, it does have clutch chatter, which is one thing a lot of people do not like, especially when we're talking about daily driving a single turbo car. That's probably the one thing that I hate about my transmission is definitely the clutch. Sure, you get used to it but let's say you had a red light you're gonna get some chatter if you're not holding down the clutch if you have the ac turned on rpms naturally go up a bit so you'll hear even more chatter i wouldn't say the dkm one is terrible because I've, I've heard worse even the one that ali has on his e90 is extremely loud like twice as loud as this one um, but that is something you have to live with and when you start to take off on first gear you either hear a squeak or you hear that like something is loose um actually i'll demonstrate that for you guys now so you can hear it okay so i have the ac turned off See if you guys can hear the clutch rattle. You can kind of hear it a little bit. It's not terrible, guys. It's not terrible. Not with the AC off. Let me go ahead and put the AC on. Now you can really hear it. Almost sounds like something's broken or loose. I mean, if you don't care what other people think about that noise, no cares, just rock it. When you're inside of the car, you can't really hear that much, just a tad bit. The only thing is when you're like under bridges, or if you're at a drive-thru at McDonald's or Wendy's or Chick-fil-A, and then they have like some kind of a roof over, a little tunnel thing, and you can really hear it, it's super loud. <laughs> you have to scream to the person taking your order or taking the payment. Uh, yes, what did you say? <laughs> All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off in first gear now to so see if you guys can hear like the initial chatter you get. That grab point is so, uh, it's kind of annoying. It does make a chatter noise unless you really drag the clutch and you can really quiet it down. But I'll do worst case scenario so you guys can hear what it sounds like if you don't do it, like, I don't know, if you don't take your time. So as you guys can see, um, depending on how you launch, how soft you do it, how fast you do it, how aggressive you are, then you'll get different sounds. Unlike stock OEM, where essentially you can just get away with anything and the, the car is still going to take off pretty smoothly. This one definitely takes a little bit of finesse. You have to get used to the car and you know drag the clutch a little bit so it can be quieter. Sometimes you get the squeak if you launch a little bit faster. Sometimes you don't if you just take your time with it. But in traffic, in situations where you want to take all fast, a lot of the times you can't get it perfect. So that gives you guys a general idea. I know for lower horsepower cars, you can get away with a 550i clutch. It can hold some power, but once you start making it up, it's gonna slip. I used to have a 550 clutch on the E90 and it was pretty bad. It would slip on second gear every single time. So twin disc, super reliable, holds all the power. There is clutch rattle. It is what it is. When the weather's cool, it's not too bad because you don't have to have the AC on. Once you have the AC on, you can really hear it. Since we're down here, we can talk about the exhaust. As you guys can tell, it's a straight pipe system. VRSF race exhaust, it's been modified just a bit so I can fit the, the down pipe from the single turbo a little bit better. Modified all the way here, cut, added a resonator so it can quiet things down. Even though I have a resonator, the car is extremely, extremely loud. It goes all the way to the back this way, around the diff, and two exits. A positive to running a race exhaust like this one versus like a street one that has a muffler in the back is that with a single turbo setup um you have more airflow less suppression so you actually hear more turbo noises which is very very nice you know something us car enthusiasts live for and you have a lot less to worry about when it comes to fitment i know you know e93s i used to own one myself fitting like aftermarket mufflers back here was always a big pain because there was like some kind of a 
I guess like a trunk bar here for rigidity purposes and the three braces it just kind of made things a little bit difficult back here so if you're running an e93 e91 e90 straight pipe is always going to be the easiest way to maneuver get it custom made so it can fit properly and it just works that way i'm going to show you guys now how the exhaust sounds like on the e90 there's not a lot of situations where you'll just be sitting in traffic revving it but if you want to i'll show you guys here that and i'll do a little bit of a drive from here to there so you guys can hear what that sounds like when you're just kind of driving at like 15 20 miles an hour as far as going faster than that, that's probably not something I'm going to be able to capture anyway. So I'll just show you guys this much. combination of the straight pipe the resonator the 6266 turbo from precision and if you guys are familiar with my car you know the open wastegate dump you combine all those sounds together at wide open throttle and is orgasmic i am telling you guys it is so good and of course you have the choice to merge the open dump into the exhaust and then you can just get that combination of sound coming out the back it just won't be as loud as having it open right here I guess it's all based on personal preference when it comes to the open dump for the wastegate. Some people like it, some don't, but if you're daily driving and you're not flooring the car, you don't really hear it. It only really opens up when you're at peak boost, which gets really loud. Some people don't like it, some people don't like it. It depends on the car, the model, the setup and stuff like that. My car, I love it. And everybody that I've ever showed my car to when I'm flooring it, they absolutely go crazy for it. I do have to be brutally honest about the straight pipe though, with a turbo system, even with the resonator. Um, if you're driving in the city, it's perfectly okay. You can kind of control the RPMs, you're fine. It's not unbearable, it actually sounds very good and it's fun to drive like that. But once you're on the highway hitting 75 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, six gear, it starts to drone. Even at the ratio that I'm running, which is 3.08, which is the OEM uh, ratio for the six speed manual, it drones 2,500 RPM, it's constant, it's annoying, and it's loud. And if you're driving 30 minutes on the highway for that long, <laughs> you're probably gonna get some hearing loss and it sucks. It tends to vibrate the car a little bit as well, so. Just keep that in mind. I haven't swapped it out yet. I haven't tried out a muffler in the back yet because I'm willing to make the sacrifice because I like the city driving so much, but the highway sucks. Unless you downshift to like fifth gear and you're on it, it's not too bad. It's only when you're cruising um, that it gets pretty annoying. If I want to try to get fuel economy, right, I would go into sixth gear, but then you'll get that nasty drone. If you're at like, let's say 72, 73, you get, you get that drone. Once you drive long enough with that drone, you lose some hearing, that's for sure. <laughs> but if you downshift, the car feels great. It's not super loud. Once you're in the power band, around 3,800 RPM right now, which I know my turbo is just gonna kick on like a rocket, I can floor it. I just wants to go and go and go and go by the way i will have links to all the modifications that were done to the e90 down in the video's description and i'm also going to have links to each individual video for each particular mod so if you guys are interested in seeing the clutch video i have a link to that you want to see the differential the axles i'll have a link to that down in the video's description so what has to be probably the most significant upgrade to the e90 probably second to the single turbo upgrade of course is the entire rear end hair so we swapped out the OEM setup. We have a custom one piece drive shaft from Seams Legit Garage, the Ford 8.8 .8 LSD. We got some unbreakable axles from G Force. And we have all the necessary hardware brackets from Seams Legit Garage to be able to 
fit this Ford 8.8 onto the E90 like it belongs there. Something that I never got to show in the, the, the video that we installed this kit is the inside of it because it was already pre-assembled. There is carbon clutch that's installed to the LSD which is a lot more aggressive and can handle all the power that I'm making. It can get a tad bit noisy especially on low RPMs. This clutch I'm just going to tell you this setup just does not like low RPM. So if you're going let's say from first gear to second gear and you're shifting at around 17, 1800 RPM it does not like it. You have to shift definitely at like 2000, 2500. That way you get minimal noise and you keep this rear end happy especially when you're in fifth and sixth gear and you're on the highway and you're trying to cruise uh it doesn't like to sit at under 2000 rpm it gets kind of noisy uh and it just wants a little bit more load which is okay i don't mind doing that just letting you guys know it's not like a stock oem system where you can roll at like 17 1800 rpm to save fuel no this setup definitely likes to be in the power band for sure you know the oem setup normally you have the two pieces so you have one you have a middle piece connects to the second piece so it can transfer power in a smoother way since you have a second piece to absorb some of that initial impact one piece you kind of get all the power delivery at once so here listen to it keep in mind that is normal um it's not like you can really hear it especially not when you have an exhaust system and everything that i have in the car it's the last thing that you hear but shifts between gears are definitely going to be a lot more aggressive and since we have solid metal mounts for the diff and not poly and not hard plastic um this removes a lot of the slop which is kind of needed for all the power but you're definitely going to get more nvh which is noise vibration harshness just because of that so you have solid mounts up here as well you have one here and you have one up top there. Uh, bushing right here is not a solid one. I actually decided to do a softer poly for that one. Originally, I wanted to swap these out also for poly too, so I can have a more comfortable ride, but it was something seems legit garage did not recommend because again, like I said, you'll get more slop and you want that, you want that immediate efficient power delivery to the rear. As far as the G-Force axles, these are supposed to hold like what, 1200 horsepower, something like that. You should be able to launch this car like nothing, burnouts, drifting. Um, they do come with a lifetime guarantee, so it's not something you have to worry about. So that's very reassuring. But they don't produce any like you know additional noise or harshness, so they're they're fine. Taking a look at the front control arms, nothing special. We have upgraded arms from a M3, which is something that a lot of 335 guys do. You get a little bit more response, a little bit more performance. Um, and it doesn't really kill the drivability as far as comfort, so these are pretty good. I am rocking coilovers from AST 5100s. These are the adjustable end links. Um, these coilovers are actually not too harsh. They feel pretty good. I have the dampening set in, I think halfway, so it's like a good point between harshness and soft. Uh, so they're not too bad. They're fully adjustable, super good quality. They have a coating that protects them from corroding over time, especially if you live in northern states. So it's a very good setup. Um, I actually sell this coilover system, this exact one, on my website. When it comes to the rear control arms, we kind of went a little bit more in depth there. We have adjustable camber arms, uh, tow arms. We have adjustable end links in the rear as well from Turno Motorsports. Uh, we decided to do that because originally we had an issue with trying to get this uh, tire setup within the fender without rubbing. So I wanted to have extra adjustability for the future, especially if I decide to track the car or take it to the drag strip. Make sure I have all the adjustability that I that I can so I can dial it in perfectly. The one thing about these arms is that they are spherical bushings, so it's technically metal on metal. So you can expect a little bit more harshness when you drive around. The good thing about it is that it helps the suspension or just like dynamics of the car fall into place better when you hit pots and you go from side to side. They can just maneuver a lot easier and freer than having a, a rubber bushing that essentially is just gonna stretch from side to side. Probably a little bit more comfortable, but it just wouldn't be as free per se. I don't have any major complaints, especially because you have the functionality of uh, adjusting them. So 
we just deal with them for now. We did change the subframe bushings uh, to poly ones. They were pretty destroyed. They were falling apart anyway. So we went with poly ones, greased them up a little bit so we don't have to be up there anytime soon. I did went with like the softest compound you can get. So they're not extremely rough. They're pretty close to rubber, just a little bit stiffer. So you still get a performance boost but they're not entirely bad. Um, I will say this, one thing that I did forget to say, when I do drive the car for a second gear, you can hear a little bit of whine, but that is one thing you wanna keep in mind that you will get a little bit of diff whine, and I think it's because of the bushings there and because of the poly bushings here on the subframe. So when you're producing 700 horsepower, you need a pretty decent wheel setup. So I got fully forged Titan 7 wheels, super light, no real con to driving them as a daily driver. They're just lighter, so they're good for performance. Um, these are the most important, and that is the tires that I'm running. These are RAAAR track tires, technically not road legal tires. Uh, super grippy when they're warmed up correctly, but extremely noisy when you drive, especially when you drive at faster speeds and like, like that tar black road. It sounds legit like a jet is taking off. Once you're driving at like 65, 70 miles an hour and you're on like that black tar road and these are like properly warmed up, they, they're sticking to the ground guys and they make a jet sound, literally like a jet is taking off. I wish I can replicate that for you guys, but the camera's mic is just not gonna pick it up. I've tried it before, so I can post it on IG stories and I really couldn't. And since these are track oriented tires, they're not gonna do very well when it comes to harshness and imperfections on the road. They're just not meant for that. This is just built to put down power and look very good and meaty, by the way. But other than that, they're not really super comfortable. Let's say like Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's, those are great tires in the rain. Uh, they're good tires for the road and some occasional track use. But if you want to put down a lot of power, Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires are not it. These are it for sure. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention, these are terrible in the rain. But like if it's raining a lot, you will start to hydroplane. And part of the reason has to be because of the thread design, which I will address right now. Let's take a look at the driver's side tires first. Notice the thread pattern right here. Supposed to grab water, channel it out to the outside of the car. That's the proper way. That's normally how tires work. Same way on this side, same way for the driver's side front. Now let's take a look at the passenger side tires, which you guys love to message me and tell me that the tires are installed incorrectly. This is an issue with Toyo. In particular, there are AAA R tires. It's a design flaw, unless there's something else that I have no idea about. Notice the thread pattern. It looks backwards, right? I did not install this tire on backwards, guys. Here's the proof. You see that right there? That says outside. These are inside outside tires, guys, not directional. They don't have tires specifically for a specific side. They're inside out, they're all the same. And sadly, front passenger side and the rear passenger side, or vice versa, however you decide to do it, it's gonna be wrong when it comes to the thread pattern. That's not my issue, and that's an issue they've had for a long time. You can find it on forums, Facebook groups, everybody talks about it. Toyo has never addressed it. I guess they don't care because these are track used tires anyways. They don't think anybody's gonna be using them on the road. Well, many people do. I don't have them installed backwards, guys. That's just a flaw with this specific tire. Which is probably why every time it rains super hard in Florida, which it does a lot, especially in the summer, I was just skating around. <laughs> I was skating around the freaking roads. It was so sketchy. I'll quickly touch base on the fuel economy. If you're looking to make 700 horsepower, there's a chance that you'll be running E85. While more affordable than traditional fuel like 91 or 93, it also burns much faster, meaning you'll be at the pump more often. If there is an E85 available nearby, then it makes things a little bit more complicated and kind of inconvenient. I'm lucky to get 150 to 170 miles to a full tank, and I consider myself to be quite conservative on the throttle. Having a stage four fuel kit from Fuel It really doesn't help. Dual Walbro 525 pumps, the minute I hit max boost, my secondary pump activates to fuel the port injection and my car chugs the fuel like nothing. An easy resolution would be to get two separate tunes, one for E85 and one for either 91 or 93, which again becomes an inconvenience. The funniest thing is after I fill up, you notice how it says I have 225 miles left to the tank. Uh, that is extremely generous because I'll never get to that amount, not even close to it, unless I drive on the highway, six gear, not flooring it at all for the entire duration of the tank, which if you have a single turbo car, you're not gonna do that. These turns right here are extremely fun, especially when you have the right setup. Sticks right to the ground. The car loves to be at those, you know, higher RPMs, mid to high, 3000 and up. I'm rubbing in the rear, I'm sure you guys can hear that. <laughs> Super aggressive wheel setup. The car is not terrible to drive. You get used to it real quick, but if you're switching between different cars, then you might actually notice how harsh the car can get. 
especially when you have all the upgrades that I have and you combine them all together, the tires, the clutch, the diff, drive shaft, the control arms, spherical bushings, all of that. It all adds up for real. First gear, I like to rev it up a little bit higher. Second gear, very smooth. Of course, the other biggest thing is the exhaust. If it wasn't for the race exhaust, I would probably have a little less vibration in here. I'm gonna keep it at like 2200 RPM so you guys can hear it. A little bit of vibration back here. But I remember I used to get a lot of the same vibration on the E93. Um, and that one had the stock rear end. It was the race exhaust that made a lot of that. It was a lot of vibration. And if you look underneath the car, there's not really anything touching. I think just think that it's just so loud that it just causes a certain frequency inside of the car. That's another issue with single turbo, um, you know, high horsepower 335s. It's never going to be, you know, peaches and cream <laughs> walking the park. There's always going to be something. DME, oxygen sensor, oxygen sensor. Another thing to think about, a lot of these single turbo kits are O2 sensor killers, especially the top mount kits. Haven't really experienced that with my DR700 bottom mount. But that is something to think about. Definitely buy your O2 sensors from FCP Euro. That way you get lifetime warranty. You don't have to worry about it. Let me clear the codes. And then I'm going to go into reset adaptations. A lot of the times if I ever have issues with these O2 sensors, I'll just reset the adaptations and it fixes it. And we should be good. No more engine light. Let's keep going. Another thing that you want to keep in mind when trying to daily drive a single turbo 700 horsepower car is that you always want to have the parameters live on the MHD or any other software that monitors that, JB4. I'm not sure what else there is out there. But you want to make sure you're looking at your parameters, especially the low pressure pump, rail pressure, depending on what your tuner tells you is acceptable. Intake temperature is big, especially if you live in a humid state like I do in Central Florida. Um, and then you got the old two sensors, of course. Cylinder timing correction, I always have one of those on screen. Uh, just in case uh, the car starts to get a little bit upset, I can see that. So David Shoot, my tuner, does want me to send him a single gear log. So I'm about to do that right now since we have a clear way. I'm sure my face is absolutely priceless when I do those logs. The car's just so goddamn fast and you gotta focus on the road and I'm looking at the RPM to make sure that I make it to at least 6,000. Um, and it's just it's just insane. It's, an, it's, it's a feeling that I really can't, can't really explain. You guys would have to go through it to truly understand. Here's the thing guys, if you're all about performance, the feel, rawness, handling, power delivery, a setup like this is not going to be an issue for you if you want a daily drive you're going to be more than happy i mean out of all the cars that i've driven this is like the one that puts the biggest smile on my face every single day i don't push it all the time but whenever i want that power it's there if I ever you know if i ever get challenged it's there i don't use it a lot I'm, I, I try not to but if you know if the right time comes and i need it or you know i just feeling it listening to the right music then <laughs> it's there and no other car can replace that feeling that's for sure you don't have to have an identical setup like the one that i have guys you can definitely go a little bit softer you can go with a m3 rear end versus what i have poly bushings instead of solid bushings you know michelin tires instead of the rAAA toyos it just depends how much performance you want I want to be able to put all the power down and especially if I decide to take the car to the drag shift, which I am actually going to do, I want to make sure that I know that the power delivery is on point. As you
you guys just saw. Uh, car was uh, skating, <laughs> zero traction. The weather's getting a little bit cooler here in Florida. Um, and these are AAA R tires. Yeah, it takes a little bit of work to get them warmed up, that's for sure. So is a 700 horsepower 335 daily drivable? I mean, sure, but it all depends on your tolerance to a more aggressive driving experience. On a high horsepower car, more things tend to fail, meaning you always have to give the car extra attention. To some, it might be worth it, and for others, not really. Me, I love my 335i as a daily, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to get notified when my next video goes live, and as always, thanks for watching. Till next time.